-hmm. you're, you're aiming for this eye of, of a needle <laughs> uh, to give off oneself completely and to be aware of the influences that can come in to turn it slightly here or turn it slightly there. Mm -hmm. But to be noble, to be vertical, and, and to say to the beloved and the beloved say to you, okay, you know, let, let's even pray. Let's pray before this sexual act. Let's pray to be our authentic selves and to not go with the program not go for the, you know, the quick orgasm or the quick ejaculation. L let's not go with the fantasy. Let's not go. Let's go with the soul. I'm Olivia Clementine, and this is Love and Liberation. Today, our guest is Anaya Sophia. Anaya Sophia is an independent mystic of an almost forgotten faith and a teacher of Kundalini Yoga. She carries an oral transmission that stirs the remembrance of the Sophia Isis Magdalene lineage. This mystical tradition is a continuous lineage with a feminine principle that throughout the centuries has preserved its spiritual dignity without a need for permission or recognition from any other source. She recognizes the need for initiation and uses the vast intelligence of her years to orchestrate those rites of passage. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Olivia. It's really my honor. I would love to just start by understanding a little bit about what influenced you to step into the work you're, you're, you're offering right now. Well, I've always had a very inquiring mind and heart. This kind of work or this kind of lifestyle has really been the only thing that has ever interested me. Even when I was a child, I was always wanting to get in. I remember when I was 12, I was at the, the, uh, um, the Sacre Coeur in Paris. It's a, an incredible cathedral up high in the Montmartre artistic region of Paris. And I was there with my mum and dad. And I saw a beggar sitting on the steps of this huge staircase that leads from the cathedral down into the art corner of, of Montmartre. And I ran to this man. There was something about him. I just knew I, I just had to be close. And so I sat in front of him, which caused him to lift his head up. And he wasn't a beggar at all. No way. He was absolutely filled with light, filled with love. And he, it felt like a family. It felt like an uncle. Mm. It was someone I recognized. And in that moment of exchange between the eyes, he absolutely passed within me a memory of something that I continued to seek after that moment. He was definitely a messenger. I haven't looked back since. <laughs> That's incredible. And you were just sharing how that you're from England originally, but you moved yes. to southern France five years ago. Can you talk about the area that you live in right now? Yes. It's, uh, it used to be known as the Languedoc. It has now gone back to its original name, which is Occitan. Um, it's a place reputed to be where Mary Magdalene came after the crucifixion to continue on the spreading of this mystical part of the Christ teachings. It's a place that centuries later became famous, unfortunately, for the Albigensian crusade against the Cathars. Um, it's another place that you could say has a thinning of the veils. So even the tectonic activity of this land mass is behaving very strange. Um, it has the same abnormal behavior as that as the Pyrenees. Pyrenees is also very famous for being a place where the veils are very thin. So there, there's, lots, there's lots to suggest that this is a, a vortex, a portal. Mm -hmm. 
unusual activity happens here. It has a huge number of sightings of this glowing white lady during the time of the, of the church, church's strong reign. Um, people were saying, oh, it's the apparition of the Virgin Mary. But if you look in your history books, you will see that this glowing white lady was appearing way before the Christian church. Even since the pagan times, there's been this glowing white lady that appears near the springs. And when you see her, you feel healed, you feel restored, you feel forgiven, you feel wiped clean. So maybe that's another reason why Mary Magdalene felt that this was the absolute right place in Europe to seed this mystical Gnostic path. And I didn't know any of this when I first came out. I wasn't even into this when I first came out. But when I first came here, it was utter love at first sight. And I just had to hang around and hang around until I felt, felt brave enough to actually buy a house. <laughs> and now we have a B and b so people can come and stay with us. So good for people to know that. Yeah. For someone that doesn't know who Mary Magdalene is, just giving a little bit. Well, usually we come to understand Mary Magdalene, probably through Bible studies, as being this repentant prostitute, a female disciple, this, this woman that absolutely caught the essence of Jesus Christ and followed him around, you know, <laughs> soaking up his teachings. That's one story. That's the biblical story. In my heart, this Mary Magdalene is easily Jesus's equal. Together, they seeded this mystical Christ path. The church has only one half of it. Mary Magdalene carries the other half of this original and whole teaching which included sexuality and marriage and the togetherness of the male and the female and how that is the perfect alchemy to enter the deeper mysteries where a man and a woman has, have become settled in their marriage, in their bridal chamber, when all of the distractions of the outer world are settled and they have found their right place. Now, the great work can begin. Um, this was part of the Christ teachings, this settling into the bridal chamber, not seeking affirmation or anything anymore outside. And so this came here. That part of the Christ teachings came here and was absolutely swallowed up in this part of the Pyrenees. And so Mary Magdalene is... Well, she is the patron saint of France anyway. <laughs> she's, so she's a real hit down here. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that I mean, I... tradition has carried on. Mm. You know, and, and obviously recently, in, in recent years, it's come out that she has most definitely been the wife of Jesus, the mother of their children, not his children, their children. She's a queen. She's a wife. She's a beloved. She's a priestess. So good. I mean, I imagine some listeners might hear this and be shocked. Yeah. So I'm glad. I'm glad you're offering some shock value and to shake us out of what we think is true yeah. without even questioning it, without even going inwards to, yes. to explore for ourselves. And and I actually just kind of while we're in this in this water right now. I'm curious if we can also just explore a little bit of sacred prostitution, shaking some of what we believe the roots of prostitution to be when they actually were something that were so valued and so honored, which is obviously very different today. And we see so much misuse of sexual power yes. and sexual energy. And it seems so connected to some of these things, these you know, big shifts in the way we are relating to sexuality and using others in this in exchange. Oh, yes. Well, the, the word prostitute really does mean to give of oneself completely, to hand over one's entirety to a greater process. Mm. 
um, if we look back into history, before Christianity, there were temples, the pagan temples, um, always found near a spring or on a spring or, or using the spring waters in some way. And during that time, the, the Godhead was seen more as a feminine presence. And these temples, you know, they're being called temple prostitutes. Um, I prefer to, to say the word temple priestess, mm -hmm. only because the word prostitute now can mean something quite derogatory. But back in that time, if there was such a word, probably not, we've made it up recently, it mm -hmm. means to simply give of oneself entirely, completely. And those temples were not some sort of seedy brothel. This was a holy environment. Mm -hmm. And the people who went to these temples were children, men, and women. Mm -hmm. And they were treated with, with holiness, with grace, with mercy and skill and presence, mm -hmm. and helping that man, woman, or child either through an important rite of passage or through an important healing presence because something rather terrible had happened to that human being. So, so in my heart, the men and the women who did this necessary and essential work, which I feel we're probably crying out deeply for, we, re we remember something that was once so wholesome, so authentic, so powerful, that we miss it. We, we miss that touch. We miss that skill, that skill of the, the wordless exchange. And so that is what I believe Mary also represented, that body work, that body presence, that body mystery of using the sexual energy, not so much the sexual act, but it could include the sexual act. But it's every, every shade of gray mm -hmm. <laughs> in between that white and dark spectrum. And when I say dark, I don't mean bad. I mean dark as in unknown, mysterious, initiation, something that the, the divine is in charge of, not so much the human. Sexual energy, was part of that process and it was decent and it was in alignment with the soul and it was appropriate and it was wisely and skillfully used to move that person on beyond their crisis, beyond their disease, beyond their stuckness. Can you share about what would happen in the temple after war time? Oh, absolutely. So back in the day of the temple, it is, it is documented that the men would first pass through the temple after coming off the battlefield. They had to. It was necessary. These men were fragmented mentally, shattered spiritually, and their bodies would also have been, you know, cut and torn and bruised. And they had to come through the temple first before they could go home to their wife and children. The temple is, we would call it church now. So it's the holy, the holy space of the community, mm. which was mostly facilitated by ladies because this is a time of the matriarch. This is the time of the goddess, where the, where the goddess, the female godhead, is the one that's being worshipped and glorified. So these poor, broken, battered, weary, shattered men would come in, still bloodied from war. And these ladies, even young girls, and this is how I remember it in my mind. I don't know if it's a memory or imagination, but a young girl would take this man by the hand. And, and, and you know, he would have chronic PTSD. And she would guide him to a slightly older woman, maybe in her 20s, who would bathe him. So she'd undress him with great care and elegance and take him into the sacred waters and just start to clean him up. And her grace and her slowness and her care would already 
start moving things in and around him. And then after the bathing, she would anoint him. She would be naked, but the man's mind is so shattered that he probably hasn't even noticed. <laughs> but the skin is already starting to comfort him. Mm. And so he is now cleaned up and ready and prepared. And then he gets passed on to an even older lady, maybe someone in her 30, 30s or 40s, who is so, or 50s, who is so able to do what needs to be done now because this is a mature and skilled piece of work. She is going to use the whole of her body to bring him into wholeness. She is going to be his love and his forgiveness and his peace. I'm starting to cry that myself until he can pick it up for himself. So she's going to be the environment of feminine presence so he can go into that awful horrible place and find himself and bring himself into wholeness and this could include a sexual exchange of the highest nobility only because that man is fragmented mm. it's got nothing to do with sexual pleasure there may be some pleasure involved, but the pleasure is serving the soul and bringing that man back home mm. into some kind of decent state so he can walk out of that temple and rejoin with his wife and children. And that is how holy and how dignified and how elegant that work once was. Mm. And in my heart is to bring that back to us all for men, women, and children. Mm -hmm. Because that is how we forgive. That is how we make whole. And that is, and that is how we can learn to trust one another again. Mm -hmm. No more battle between the sexes, and no more battle between women, and no more battle between men. When do you think that was? If, if ancient Egypt was 5,000 years ago, and the church came in about 2,000 years ago. I would say that's about 3,000 years ago, that time. Uh, what I understand, it's kind of been matriarchy, patriarchy, matriarchy, patriarchy, and we've kind of swung from one to the other. Mm -hmm. And it's very common when patriarchy comes in that, that that sexual element of the spirit gets shoved underground. And when the matriarchy comes in, it comes back in. And it looks like we're going into another matriarchal period, but we're, many of us are hoping that that is not going to be so because what we, what we want is the union. We want a new word. We don't want matriarchy or patriarchy. We want some sort of word that's got archi on the end, but it means union. <laughs> and then we'll stop swinging. Yeah. And then we can have this wonderful period of peace because the two are operative the two are in charge of our spiritual endeavors mm -hmm. not one or the other so we've got the fabulousness of consciousness and the fabulousness of embodiment because that is what the two promote one or the other <laughs> no let's have both and of course now Sexual energy is like flying around all over the place. <laughs> and we've lost that alignment with verticality. But it is absolutely coming back to us now. I would love to get into that, the coming back to us. And even just for, you know, like how, how do we bring that back into our life? How, how do we remember those teachings and that potential of divine union? And curious in terms of merging with somebody or finding, you know, your beloved or your, the, the person that you want to be with and or feels in alignment for you. And then how do you access that if it's so unfamiliar, you know, in this new age? This is what I'm calling the great work because mm -hmm. we can read this stuff and we're nodding as we're reading going, yes, yes, yes. We can talk it. Totally. <laughs> we can explain it 
really well to our partners. And what I've noticed is once the bodies start coming together, that's when we have to be extremely mindful because our body, I mean, I'm nearly 50. My body is conditioned to be a certain way. And that conditioning, you know, that sort of like uh, enticement to be a certain way as a woman in the sexual act, I believe has come from this patriarchal slant, be seductive, be a tease, turn him on, be wanton, be sexual. And yet the truth is so close. Of course there's a wild element. Of course there's a powerful element. But it is in alignment with our hearts. We're not doing it to tease the man, the man. We're not doing it to seduce the man. We're not doing it to get some sort of power over him. So the truth is so close to the false, to the lie. Mm. And so we have to be very careful because when the bodies start getting involved, that's when the condition program can wake up and go, oh, we're meant to be having sex right now. Right. And the lower, when I say lower, I mean the parts of us that reach a certain ceiling. And we know that ceiling. We know where this goes. We know this inside and out. Mm -hmm. But of course, the sacred, the sacred could and will take us on a different journey. A, a, a journey into heart, into prayer, into devotion. Because I, I, I wonder whether... There are influences out there that just want us humans to just be distracted in the world of sex. Just go over there, stop asking uncomfortable questions, go over there and have some sex. <laughs> That'll keep you quiet for a while. That'll keep you at a certain level of awakening. Mm -hmm. Whereas the sacred has the opportunity to take you to full awakening, full awareness, and being able to see quite clearly the mechanisms that are actually going on before our very eyes, these, these mechanisms of control, these mechanisms of subtle slavery to a false world. This form of sexuality and sacred exchange will free you from that. And that is why they say, go over there and have a bit of sex. Be quiet. And I believe this is exactly what Mary Magdalene was absolutely sharing with Yeshua, with Jesus, so that he could do and say what he didn't say and become such a powerful figure that we're still talking about him today, 2,000 years later. So many of us, when we think of spirituality, we think of being good. Mm. And when we think of being good, it's like, yeah, we can be intimate, but there's a boundary to that intimacy. Yes. Really appreciate even what you were speaking of before of what prostitution means, mm. the the original definition of really letting yourself go completely. Yes, and you know, and that is the awakening of like how do we get past egoic, habitual, cultural? Yes, yes, and it really is you know an eye of a needle. Mm. You're, you're aiming for this eye of of a needle. <laughs> Uh, to give of oneself completely and to be aware of the influences that can come in to turn it slightly here or turn it slightly there. Mm -hmm. But to be noble, to be vertical and, and to say to the beloved and the beloved say to you, okay, you know, let, let's even pray. Let's pray before this sexual act. Let's pray to be our authentic selves and to not go with the program not go for the you know the quick orgasm or the quick ejaculation L let's not go with the fantasy let's not go let's go with the soul can you talk a little bit about the difference between the beloved and and a person that's looking for their soulmates so the beloved again this is just my ideas well yeah this is <laughs> 
Of course, of course. But I mean, I, it's, you know, I feel like I used to ask questions like, well, from your perspective, but it's like, obviously we each have our own perspective. So there's no need for that preamble. Yes. To me, the beloved is the one who says yes and absolutely means it. The one who is going to go on this huge awakening, unraveling, liberating journey on every single level, physical, financial, sexual, emotional, psychological, spiritual. The real deal. Which I feel will eventually lead to some new nameless union. You could say the sacred androdyne. You could say this third and unknown quality because it really is a dance of masculine and feminine. So they're going to dance, 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 dance until they come together and fuse. So I, I feel we're going to become some new kind of hybrid human mm. if we actually get through this eye of the needle and liberate ourselves so that we're absolutely aware of everything that's going on around us and not buying into the old program really choosing wisely and with great maturity what is right for self, the other, and the family, and the education, and the community. A soulmate, on the other hand, will prepare us to meet the beloved. So the soulmate is going to point out the shadows, point out the ways in which we're holding ourselves back, and just encourage us to become more and more sovereign, more and more authentic. And usually there isn't too many fireworks around that. The soulmate union is very easy, very comfortable, because the pair of you, you you're not thinking about it, it just happens. The pair of you are just encouraging you to really rise up, and start delivering your sacred essence out into the world. It's a gorgeous relationship. You don't rock the boat. You don't agitate each other. You don't initiate each other. It's very pleasant. And then that prepares you to meet the beloved. And this is a very mature and authentic, great alchemical work. But unfortunately, or fortunately, the two, the two egos are really going to rub together now because you're on a genuine path of truth. Nothing false can remain. And so the love and the attraction is huge. But then the real thinning, the, the real mellowing, I don't think for one minute the the entire ego structure can disappear, but it's going to be rubbed right down <laughs> into something extremely mellow, gentle, and graceful to live with. And of course, that kind of relationship can be extremely volatile, mm -hmm. chaotic, wild, and mad. But if the beloved is true to his or her word, you will continue on regardless. You will reach home together as, as a hybrid human. You will be both masculine and feminine at the same time. So just because you're a woman doesn't mean you're the feminine one. Just because you're a man, you're not a masculine one. You are an absolute blend of the two. And I feel, and obviously we're all at the beginning stages of this, I feel when this really starts happening, we're going to change appearance. We're going to become quite androgyne. Yeah. The yogis even tell us that our genitalia will sort of withdraw into the body because they're just not needed anymore. Mm. The body mass and shape is going to even take on a different character. In gratitude to our listeners and to support the making of this podcast, we want to let you know that you receive 10% off our shop 
of online courses in botanical delights, including tonics, teas, and skincare. Visit oliviaclementine.com and at checkout enter the code LOVE and LIBERATION for the discount. And if you've enjoyed this, please leave a review and rating through iTunes. This helps this podcast become more visible to new listeners. Thank you, and now on to part two. What would you say to somebody that wants to begin that journey of becoming more of a sensual being? It's so important that we have developed a feminine presence on the inside. Mm -hmm. Because this is the part of us that will heal and comfort and, and crown, if you like, when we're on our spiritual path. If we haven't developed a feminine presence, then we won't be able to self-comfort. We won't be able to self-love. We won't be able to self-forgive because that's the feminine part of us that's doing all of that tender work. Mm -hmm. So it's so important. So even if we begin the work by saying, oh, I just want to come into contact with my sensual side, great. (laughs) But I also want to flag up to the listeners, we so need this feminine part because this is the part that forgives. This is the part that can be devotional and worshipful. This is the part that says those beautiful comforting words when we're having a really hard time with this inner work. So we really need the feminine. And I guess the way I got into it, I got into it through bhajans. Um, So I remember going to my first Krishna Das concert (laughs) and, you know, happily singing along with the mantras, this is great, this is great. And then suddenly, up it comes. Oh my God, here comes sadness. But it was a blend of happy sadness. So up comes my sadness, but I'm starting to get into devotion. And I didn't know that you, it was okay to cry. But this wasn't crying. This was something bigger than crying. And I'm looking around and I'm realizing everyone else has gone there. So I've got permission. And that was the first crack of my heart feeling the devotion and it was huge Mm -hmm. and that of course led to yoga that started opening the body so anything that opens bodies that led to the five rhythms and then that led to more of the tantric work and then finally that led to myself asking in asking a very a mature female tantrika who I already had an affinity and friendship and respect for to say, okay, I invite you. <laughs> I, I want to know what do you mean by opening my body? I recognize I I'm getting to a certain place with my boyfriends, my partners. I seem to hit a wall. And I can't get past this wall, but I want to because my heart wants to and my soul needs to. Mm. So I'm going to put myself in your hands because I kind of trust you. So let's go there. Mm. And I said, this needs to be very holy, very sacred, because I've got a bit of a thing going on that sexuality is separate from the spirit. So I really need to heal this. So please keep it holy. Mm. And she's looking at me going, sweetie, of course. (laughs) (laughs) And bless her amazing heart. We entered this ceremony together. And now I realize just how far bodies can go. There is so much inside of us in terms of energy, in terms of love, in terms of breath, in terms of trust, in terms of innocence and joy. 
Mm. And this lady, it was like I was a keyboard. She knew exactly what keys and what sequence, and then she pressed enter. <laughs> and my entire system flew open mm. and a divine presence was felt. Mm. That was done with the sexual energy. She hardly did anything. So it's not as if, you know, we were rolling around on the floor. Oh, no, 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 no. It's not that. She just knew how to guide that sexual energy through the chakras, out through the top of my crown, and into the lap of God. The most decent, the most authentic awakening I've ever had. And this is something that you offer people, this kind of guidance, right? Yes. Would you say that? Yes, yes. I see the kind of emphasis on the fact that there's no nothing outside that needs to recognize yes. um, our capacity to be able to be initiated in this way. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Because this lineage is so sovereign, so true, it's very easy for womankind, I'm really talking about women now, to deny its purity or deny its power or deny its unbroken lineage and legacy. And it takes a lot for woman to be able to hold her head up high and say, I am part of this. Now, for the, for the American lady, this can be not really understood. For the European lady, <laughs> we totally get this. Mm -hmm. Our history is different. We've had the witches. We've had the crusades. We've had this very heavy church oppression for so many centuries. And so it's really tricky for the European woman to raise her head and say, I am part of this awakening. Mm -hmm. I noticed that for the, for the ladies of the States, you can do this so much easier because the history isn't quite so heavy as it is in Europe. It's interesting. I never thought about it that way because, you know, there's also a different kind of expression of, of sexuality in Europe that does feel more expressive in other ways. Yes, 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 faith, absolutely. You know? we, all, we all have a different piece. Yeah. It's a fabulous question, and I haven't quite developed the answer yet. But yes, there is an authentic, holy, graceful method of opening up bodies to the divine presence using the sexual force. One of the things that you share practices on are healing specific wounds related to like, for instance, you have the prophet wound, the priestess wound. And, you know, I don't know if you want to get into any of them specific, but even just the nature of cultural wounding and and kind of how you've come to some of these antidotes or remedies mm, for yes. some of these wounds. Well, you know, the, all these wounds are coming in via the archetypes. And archetypes are patterns of energy. So it's, it's, um, it's like another bunch of people. Mm. It's just we can't see them. <laughs> They're all around us hoping to act out their, their dramas, you know, their fabulous theater through us. But they're also a bunch of beings, also hoping and praying for, for a liberating bite of the apple so that they too can change and, and, and upgrade to a higher resonance. That, that's what I feel. I really, I really feel strongly about that. Everybody is looking to raise their game. And so we can buy into an archetypal role, which is very fabulous. You know, it's very glamorous. You do get a surge of power. You do. Um, and, and it can, and you can use that power wisely and with great kindness and, and you're on the path, but you're, you're caught up in an archetypal pattern and that is not the end of the game. 
and you can if you get really you know re you, you develop a real affinity with this archetype you can stay stuck there you can stay stuck there for the whole incarnation be in the prophetess be in the sacred prostitute be in the messiah or the martyr and so it's it's wise to be able to see that you have hooked into an archetype and maybe you might want to unhook from that and the two of you together raise to the next octave. Mm. And who knows what that archetype pattern could become. I mean, I find it fascinating and exciting that, that we can all go together. Mm -hmm. And also the archetypes they do as fabulous as they are as as gregarious you know they are mythical beings it's wonderful to work with them but by golly they have a wound and that wound because i have felt a couple of them they're they're bigger than any human wound this is massive material massive grief massive sadness these are the characters that have inspired shakespeare and all of our great film directors. So yes, it's wonderful to play with them, but by golly, when it's time to feel the wound, the, the trauma of that archetype, it's huge. Um, so yeah, that might be another reason why to unhook, because it, this grief might not be yours. Mm. Although you will, have, you will have a part of it, because that's what the attraction's all about. But it might not necessarily have to go as deep as you are prepared to go. This might be archetype, archetypal wounding. So, so it's wonderful to release. So basically people are taking on certain ar archetypes and latching onto them. And then they're also potentially taking on the wounding that's not theirs to carry. So a lot of this is about letting go of the archetype, first recognizing what archetype you might be connected to, yes. and then letting go of it so you're also not the bearer of the wounding, but also so you can just be a more free being. Because I think so many people are right now are being trained in certain archetypes, like become the priestess, become this, <laughs> and, yes. and without maybe recognizing that there's actually potentially a greater bondage in that archetype than a, than a liberation. Absolutely. And I do feel that the real medicine is in sacred union, mm -hmm. either as a one or with another. And archetypes will not allow that to happen because they will want to keep you invested in them and archetypes don't really have beloved counterparts so the priestess she doesn't really get together with her beloved the magician he doesn't really get together with his beloved the prophetess, the martyr, the, the Judas, the Christ, the Messiah, they're all lone wolves. They're all lone rangers. They won't get to have this bridal chamber where the two of you in great humility rub each other into smoothness. You see what I mean? There's a catch. Energy there. Yeah. But it really should be seen only as a step and a stage. It's not the end game. We talk about that soul union. What does that look like for someone that's not with their beloved yet? So an inner marriage or a sacred union, or let's just say inner marriage, that, that like makes that. a bit more clarity. So an inner marriage is when you realize that you really are a vessel of masculine and feminine energy. And you, you look at wanting to balance that. So first of all, there's a, there's a massive realization. You have both qualities and you'll probably have one more developed than the other. So the great work is to bring these two into union. The masculine part of us is the one that goes out there and becomes something and starts bringing home money and starts buying cars and houses and credit cards 
and and really is really invested in the outer world and your status and your career and and your facebook and your instagram and your likes and you know all of that and your youtube videos that is masculine energy the inner part of us is is the inner mystic the yogi the meditator the one who prays the one who just closes the eyes to the world and feels in and takes a shamanic journey and has a sweat lodge and and goes to peru for a month that's the feminine part who has no interest no interest in facebook and website design and money but the one who turns inward and that is what we're looking to balance that we're spending just as much time on the inside as we do on the outside. And then we start to develop these masculine and feminine qualities. So the feminine part of us is obviously tender, loving, embracing, intimate, vulnerable. The masculine part of us is direct, finishes off everything he starts, dependable, keeps his word, keeps his promises. And, and that is just wonderful when you start holding those two energies and you can be that, that in appropriate ways to anyone. Mm -hmm. So you can draw on your feminine when it's time to be tender. You can draw on your masculine when it's time to raise a boundary. Wonderful. And that kind of person will attract another one of equal standing. Mm -hmm. Now it gets really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I saw that you recently got married. Did is this recent? Yeah. yeah. Can you share yeah. about that? I mean, it, I actually saw some beautiful videos of you both online and mm. so inspired by obviously the way you share in presence and practice together. Yeah, Pete, my, my darling Pete. He, he showed up literally on my doorstep three years ago. Now I, I live in the French Pyrenees in the mountains in this, you know, Magdalene Cathar land. And before I met Pete, I knew that I was sort of bullshitting myself a little bit. And I knew I needed a really sovereign time of inner marriage proper. My nature was to be a little bit flirtatious and have a few guys on the go. <laughs> and I just knew, no, come on, lady. It's time to really do what you say to everyone else they need to do. You're just going to close down all those back doors. And you're going to make yourself a nice little bridal chamber. And you're going in for a really deep dive. So I did, and I was ready, and I was, abs it was, you're absolutely right, I'm doing this. And so I went in to a very authentic inner marriage. And I was in that state for about nine, ten months. And all the search for the outer beloved totally diminished. And everything was just pure prayer. And, and, and fulfillment. And then came a little message on Facebook from Pete, we're friends, that he is doing a 10 day walk in the French Pyrenees, walking the Cathar pathways. And he would love to just drop in and say hi. And I agreed. And the day came, and the front door is glass. So I saw him sat there on the steps with his back to me. And I just knew it is true. And God said, God has said, who, you know, whoever this great one is. The prayer was, the, the answer to the prayer was, I heard the voice over and over again. You do not have to do anything. He will come to your front door. He shall be delivered. Have faith. You don't have to do anything. He will come. And I just knew when I saw him there, he has shown up. And that was that. And he had a ticket to go back to Denmark. And 
he tore it up <laughs> and he simply stayed he never went back we have been and are on this huge sincere and sometimes extremely rough but honest and decent journey together everything every layer of existence is being rubbed and alchemized i mean it's wonderful because there's nowhere to go but but higher in not higher as in greater higher mm. as in more humble mm. higher as in kinder higher as in peaceful higher as in joyful mm. is there anything else you would like to share mm. i just like to put another little something out there i'm just finishing off a book at the moment called fierce fierce feminine one woman's journey to find her authentic voice and there's a, a chapter i've done called the forces of anti-awakening mm. so just to you know bring that up there are energies and situations and circumstances and people although it's not the person but it's an influence that comes through them that are geared up to, to keep a ceiling on your awakening, mm. to make sure you don't go beyond that ceiling. And this kind of influence is everywhere. Mm. And I feel it's particularly invested in the social media. So be aware. You know those moments when you read a post and then you kind of like feel a bit sick? It's like... Mm. Definitely. That's one of them. That's one of those influences. Um, so just to... Will just you give me another example, like a specific one, um, or like something that's being said that we can pay attention to? Mm. I, well, I also call it the elephants in the room. Those invisible energies that are just around, that are there on purpose to trigger unworthiness, mm. Jealousy, anger, um, hate. So they are placed there on purpose because you're getting close to something authentic. And so a little curveball <laughs> comes in to try to trigger this response in you, which will, which will swerve you away from where you were heading. Which, which could be a, a rather fabulous leap of consciousness. So just be hyper aware of your activity mm -hmm. online, what you're saying yes to, what and who you're getting involved with, what group, and yeah, just stay awake. Mm -hmm. We yeah. can easily just keep opening up to everything. Totally, mm -hmm. and get involved in a thread that is yeah. so obviously on a downward spiral and you're hooked in because you're invested. Well, there's that feeling of being active in this world versus passive. So some, yeah. you know, sometimes we think, oh, well, if I'm in being active means I need to be a part of all of these things that are happening, even yeah. if maybe there is that kind of energy that's yes. draining yeah. us. Yes. Yeah. And, and to really use our intuition because we can all sense it. Yeah. We can all sense when something's off yeah. and to pay attention to that little red flag coming in via the intuition. Let's, let's stop trampling on our intuition. Let's be sharp, listen, respond. It is there. If you feel that something's off, that's because something's off. Mm. Trust, trust that something better always comes along because the offness is the swerve. If, if we show up for the offness, then in will come the authentic beauty or joy or peace that was on its way. It's, it's, it's nanoseconds after we realize something's off. Mm. But if we say, oh, it's not so bad, that person, this group, da 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 da, and off we go, we don't get our. We don't get what was coming, the good stuff. And you know what? Sexuality can sharpen this skill. If we follow the vertical path. It's these kind of subtle skills that get awakened. 
Thank you so much. Such a joy to connect with you. Likewise.